show that Soviet Jews are immigrating at more than twice last year's rate. Just last month, nearly 4,000 arrived in Vienna, most awaiting final resettlement in the United States. As Soviet immigrants come here in search of a new life, correspondent Richard Schlesinger reports a disturbing number of them are finding that life in crime. <laughs> In the shadow of this country's vibrant and growing Soviet emigre community, mixed in among some of America's newest immigrants are some of America's newest criminals, sophisticated, organized, and violent. We're talking about hundreds of people who have immigrated here who are now involved in organized criminal activities. This is a group. This is a ring. This is a gang. Pretty soon it'll be an army. Bootleg gasoline was the Soviet mobster's ticket to the big time. Teaming up with the mafia, they took advantage of a weakness in the tax laws and sold gasoline without paying any tax. It was their most lucrative scheme. It was nearly $150 million or more that was stolen by this combined group in one year. In their race to make money, Soviet mobsters often print their own. All the money you're looking at, $1.4 million worth, is counterfeit. They don't just print uh, $100,000, they'll, they'll print $20 million. Most of the Soviet mobs got organized here in the heavily Soviet neighborhood of Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. They are not as organized as the Italian mafia yet. Still, they've been able to extend their influence far beyond the borders of Brooklyn. You will generally find Soviet immigrants in New York City, Miami, Los Angeles in the United States. You will find them in Toronto, Canada. Hold up the overhead door there and I'll back the truck in and we'll get started. Police say the Soviets are expert con men. The man in the white shirt is a Soviet emigre named Mark Gorlick. He's taking a delivery of luggage. He and another Soviet ran a scam telling businessmen they were running sales promotions. They were so convincing that major companies agreed to deliver almost $200 million in furs, luggage, and other items before being paid. These items wouldn't have lasted more than a few hours on the street. That's how quickly they would have been sold. It never got that far. In this case, the delivery men are undercover police officers. We have additional bad news for you. We're not truckers. We're not with the furniture business or the luggage business. We're police officers, and you're under arrest. Police say the Soviet gangsters don't fear American justice. Okay. Even if they get caught, it's mine in comparison uh, what they would get in, in Russia. This Soviet emigre has dealt with the mobs and doesn't want to be identified. When it comes to business, they, uh, they're ready to, to, go to, to, to go to war. There have already been casualties in that war. A leader of one Soviet mob was shot dead in his Rolls Royce after he became a government informant. This organized crime element, Russian immigrants, they kill anybody. I think they're far more dangerous than organized crime as we know it. 100,000 Soviets are expected to apply for U.S. visas next year. The overwhelming majority are honest. But there is no way for American authorities to know who is looking to benefit from our system and who is looking to exploit it. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, New York. Overseas, FBI Director Louis Free is finishing up an unprecedented mission to Moscow. Besides setting up an FBI office in Moscow, he signed a cooperation agreement with the Russians aimed at fighting the fast-growing Russian mafia over there and here in America. Apparently, apparently, this international effort against the Moscow vice mob comes not a moment too soon. As correspondent Jim Stewart reports, it's already clear what the FBI is up against. The director of the FBI didn't have to look hard for signs of organized crime in Moscow. The evidence was everywhere. And now Russian mobsters are coming to America, joining forces with what police still call the LCN, La Cosa Nostra. They come over here and they look at the way LCN has done business in the past. And they learn from the experiences of when the members of the LCN have been caught. What the Russians are finding is a mafia that has suffered losses, like the conviction of John Gotti, but is far from dead. And still has a strong hold over the construction industry, unions, and the local fish market. The new godfather experts say is an odd character named Vincent Gigante. 
he puts on an act of being a mental retard. And he walks around Sullivan Street with a bathrobe on, and he has avoided actually going to trial because of this, these antics. But he is one of the strongest leaders left in organized crime. Which is still concentrated in five New York-based families, while elsewhere police say its power is waning and gone altogether in some cities like San Francisco, Cleveland, and Philadelphia. In fact, the FBI has reassigned an entire squad of organized crime agents in New York from the old Cosa Nostra to the new gang in town, the Russians. Many in Congress agree with the strategy shift. It's uh, drug running as such and smuggling and uh, the laundering of funds, uh, linking up with a network in this country by uh, the Russian uh, organized crime elements, uh, I think poses a, a new and serious threat. A threat that has already resulted in 20 Russian mob murders, just like those on the streets of Moscow, right here in the United States. Jim Stewart, CBS News, Washington. Law enforcement officials say the new Russia's number one export to America has been organized crime, and they're planning to prove it in court, as Anthony Mason reports in tonight's Eye on America. When Vyacheslav Ivankov was arrested in New York on extortion charges this summer, the FBI called it the most important arrest ever made in the federal government's expanding priority attack on Russian organized crime in the United States. Russian television reporting the arrest called Ivankov probably the biggest name in the Russian criminal world. He's not the top man. There really is no Al Capone back in Russia who's pulling the strings. But of the seven or ten top um, crime figures that we know of in the Russian underworld, he's probably right up there. Ivankov's rank in the underworld is tattooed right on his shoulders, the eight-pointed star said to be the sign of a thief-in-law, the Russian equivalent of a godfather. The FBI has said, officials in Russia say, that you are a godfather in Russian organized crime. I can look anybody straight in the eye, Ivankov told us in his first television interview from inside a federal detention center in New York. These are dirty, false fabrications of the Russian police and the KGB. And to prove it, he's hired a team of high-priced attorneys who've represented prominent organized crime figures in the U.S. They'll have some explaining to do. Why, for example, was Ivankov found to own seven passports under five different names from four countries, including a German passport, a stolen Polish passport, and a British passport under the alias Raymond Eustace. For the FBI's new Russian organized crime squad, Ivankov's presence in the U.S. personifies a threat which director Louis Free warned of on a recent trip to Moscow. We see more and more cases where Russian organized crime is combining with other organized crime groups to commit uh, violations of our laws in the United States. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 at a dacha outside of Moscow, author Stephen Handelman says gang leaders held a summit. And Ivankov was given a mission to go to the U.S. to look for business opportunities here. Settling in the Russian community of Brighton Beach, Ivankov, the FBI believed, was here to take control of a Russian mob damaged by the law. Now in trial, now in prison. And weakened by feuding. Killed in Brighton Beach boardwalk. Reporter Alex Grant of the Russian language Dele Novoi Ruskoi Slova says Ivankov was immediately paid respect. Because the position of thief-in-law, as Ivankov was, obliged him to control or, well, to authorize any criminal doing. The FBI now alleges Ivankov supervised an extortion ring that demanded three and a half million dollars from two Russians doing business in the U.S. They made him an offer they couldn't refuse. I think that's a good way of putting it. In April, on a Moscow subway platform, the father of one of the businessmen was found beaten to death. The FBI has accused you of extortion. It's an absurd accusation, Ivankov says. I deny this charge. It's absurd and the trial will prove it. He claims he's in the import-export business, but the FBI, after tracking him through New York, Los Angeles, Denver, Miami, and Toronto, believes he has a very different mission. And they worry, if Ivan Koff has come to America, who will follow? In New York, I'm Anthony Mason for Eye on America. 
Among the imports from Russia, the U.S. government would just as soon keep out, is organized crime. Congress will open an investigation tomorrow. CBS News correspondent Anthony Mason has been doing his legwork, his own investigation, and tonight has the inside story of the so-called Russian mafia in this country. Why are you protecting your own identity? Afraid of my safety, safety of my family. Call him Boris. Because Law enforcement uh, sources call him an insider in Russian organized crime. If they knew who you were, what do you think would happen? As usual, traffic accident or just murder. His life's in danger not only because he's willing to talk about the Russian mafia in America, but because he's willing to name its godfather. Can you tell me who? Uh, Vyacheslav Ivankov. Vyacheslav Ivankov was charged last year with leading a multi-million dollar extortion ring. Russian criminals across the country, Boris says, must pay Ivankov respect in cash. What happens if you don't pay him? You're in a trouble. What kind of trouble? Deep travel. Ivankov's rank is tattooed right on his shoulders, the eight-pointed star, the sign of a thief-in-law, a Russian godfather. The FBI has said that you are a godfather in Russian organized crime. It's absurd, Ivankov said in his only television interview last year. There are no Russian godfathers. It's not true. He is the boss. <laughs> he is the boss of bosses. Next week, Ivankov goes on trial in Brooklyn. Tomorrow, Boris takes the witness stand in Washington. In this room, the Senate Investigation Subcommittee will hold hearings tomorrow on Russian organized crime. And from behind a screen, the witness identified on the agenda only as anonymous Russian criminal will unveil the inner workings of what Russians call the organizatsia. They've had a gasoline, fuel tax fraud, insurance fraud, extortion, murder, so it, it, it's a, uh, a growing threat. Even in jail, Boris says, Ivankov is still in charge of an increasingly ruthless Russian mob. It's like disease. A disease that's spreading. Anthony Mason, CBS News, Washington. In tonight's Eye on America, we conclude our CBS News investigation of the new organized crime. As we reported, the old line Cosa Nostra has fallen on hard times with law enforcement busting its leaders and busting up their businesses. But that does not mean the end of organized crime. CBS's Jim Stewart reports a new mob is moving in and spreading out inside the underworld. Inside, you'd swear this was Russia. Everything from the food to the music, says Moscow. But one look outside, and you know it's not. This is Miami Beach, and the Russians aren't just coming anymore. They're already here. But just who wonders American law enforcement lately are these people? Are they hardworking immigrants? Or are they from Russia's violent underworld? The criminal side of immigration that's turned the old Soviet Union into a war zone and produced gangs so powerful they've even infiltrated the Russian Justice Department. That old man you see in the middle of this Russian police surveillance tape obtained by CBS News was Russian Attorney General until he was caught cavorting in the nude in this mob-owned bathhouse. And now those mobs are moving to America. First. For the, when I just joined KGB, this is that means work for former KGB agent Eamon Godzeoff, who's advising South Florida cops on what to look for. It's uh, extortion, it's uh, homicide, uh, drugs, direct trafficking. And why Miami? It's climate. Sunny Florida. Why not? Beats Moscow. Yeah. It's driven South Florida lawmen to form a special task force to keep up with the organizations. Have you been able to put together a, a family tree, if you will, like the mafia on the sure. Russian organized crime? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Just pages and pages of them. So we've got Russian mobsters in Miami. Sounds kind of hard to believe, doesn't it? Well, how about Fargo, North Dakota? We found them there, too, as well as Richmond, Virginia, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Louisville, Kentucky. In fact, there are more than 100 major criminal investigations going on involving Russians in this country today. And the FBI says that doesn't even begin to cover the problem. It's not this, the street thug that we're seeing here, by and large. There's a lot of money coming over. Far from their old haunts in Brighton Beach, New York, 
The new Russian mob is running multi-million dollar auto insurance scams in California and buying a dozen offshore banks in the Caribbean. The difference is that the uh, Russian mobs are coming over with tremendous sophistication. They have access to, to modems and faxes and, unfortunately, nuclear devices. That's right. If you want part of the old Soviet arsenal, the Moscow mob is offering one-stop shopping. Earlier this year, the Russian owner of a Miami strip club was peddling this used submarine to Colombian drug lords. And more recently, two men offered anti-aircraft missiles like these. <laughs> FBI Director Louis Free is so concerned he's opened three new Russian crime squads this year. He's also transferred Russian-speaking agents from espionage to organized crime units and is encouraging Russian police to go on stakeouts with Americans. But back in Miami, the goal for now is just keeping track of the new mob's money. They like to uh, partake of the sun and the beach and buy condos and that sort of thing, which is actually very helpful to us. Why? Be well, because if, if they buy enough condos, uh, we'll know where to find them. So please, encourage you. Come on down. It's an open invitation to America's newest ethnic group, but good only so long as they leave the bloodshed back home. In Miami, this is Jim Stewart for Eye on America. One of the main factors in Russia's struggling economy has been the stranglehold on power by members of organized crime. But Russia isn't the only place that Russian crime lords call home. Our Bill Plant has more on that. Bill, good morning. Good morning to you, Brian. You know, when most people think of the mob in this country, they get the images of the Godfather movies, and more recently, The Sopranos in their heads. It's La Cosa Nostra, the Italian mafia. But over the last 30 years, it is Russian organized crime, which has grown to pose a real threat to its traditional counterpart. And law enforcement officials think maybe an even greater threat in the future. Now, Italian organized crime in America is a pimple on a horse's ass compared with Russian organized crime in America and, and globally. The Russians have something that no crime group in the world has. They have their own state to work from. In fact, a former superpower. Robert I. Friedman is the author of the new book, Red Mafia, How the Russian Mob Invaded America. Friedman says Russian organized crime emerged here during the 1970s era of detente with the former Soviet Union. Under pressure from the Nixon administration, Moscow agreed to allow more Soviet Jews to emigrate. But in a move copied years later by Fidel Castro, the Soviets opened prison doors in the Gulag and thousands of hardcore criminals left for the U.S. They were, you know, veterans of the cruelest uh, penal colony uh, in history. And occasionally when they were arrested by the police uh, under interrogation, they would, you know, almost all say, you know, I spent 10 years on the Arctic Circle. What do you think you can do to me? Many of the Soviets came here to Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. They call it Little Odessa because it reminds them of the resort back home on the Black Sea. Brighton Beach is now ground zero for Russian organized crime in the U.S. The vast majority of Russian emigres here are law-abiding citizens, but those who aren't are a rapidly growing menace. We've seen them engaged in penny stock manipulation, gas excise tax scams, health care fraud, uh, cyber crimes. Th these are all sorts of uh, crimes that others had not really thought of. Organized crime in America already has a bloody history. But Friedman says the Russians are even more ruthless than the mobsters who preceded them. Oh, oh. Italian organized crime has an unwritten rule that they don't go after cops, that they don't go after prosecutors, that they don't go after American journalists. The Russians go after everybody. One retired cop told me uh, in New York, you know, they'll shoot you just to see if the gun works. Case in point, Vyacheslav Ivankov. The eight-pointed star tattoos on his chest show that he belongs to the highest rank of the Russian underworld. He was kicked out of Russia by the ruling council of mobsters because he was killing so many people. He first brought our attention to the, uh, the issue of organized crime from the Eurasian community, and he heightened the FBI's interest. Ivankov, reputed to be the godfather of the Russian mob in this country, is currently serving a nine-and-a-half-year prison term for extortion. Prosecutors say that he ran a criminal network that stretched clear across the country. And then there's the case of Ludwig Van Berg, a.k.a. Tarzan. According to Friedman, the Miami nightclub owner arranged the sale of this Russian submarine complete with a captain and a crew 
to Colombian drug runners. He was arrested first, but if the deal had gone through, it would have given the Colombians huge new smuggling capability. It was able to contain 40 tons of, of coke, and the idea was that it was supposed to run uh, as a retrofitted kind of Jacques Cousteau kind of vessel up and down the coast of uh, the Pacific North America. Friedman says there's good reason to worry about Ivankov, Tarzan, and their friends. What the Italians were able to do was uh, to get into labor unions, to get into legitimate industries, to use their money to uh, corrupt major politicians, cops, prosecutors, sometimes even fix political races. The Russians aren't at that stage yet in America, but they'll learn. They'll learn very quickly. Law enforcement officials say they are learning very quickly. They say that the Russians are particularly good at laundering money, and money laundering is, of course, the lifeblood of organized crime, and other crime groups are using them to launder their money. The Russians are also operating in about 50 countries, and that makes them, according to the FBI, a transnational threat, and the FBI says it will take a uh, multi-nation effort to go after them, right? Bill, that was fascinating stuff. Real quick, are the Russians organized in the same fashion as what we've commonly come to believe organized crime represents here, or are they mainly independent operators? No, they are organized, and they're organized in a much tighter group than traditional uh, crime circles in America because they're newer and because they are bound together by all the ties to the homeland. This makes them very focused and, according to the FBI, very dangerous. Okay. Bill, thanks very much. Have a great weekend. You too. From the moment the Salt Lake City Olympics were, or at least Salt Lake City was selected to host the 29th Winter Olympics, the games were tainted by scandal. And tonight, months after the closing ceremonies, it appears the bribery and improper influence already exposed represented just the tip of an iceberg of criminal corruption. Jim Axelrod reports. A half year after the Olympic skategate scandal, when judges of both this competition pairs ice skating and this one, ice dancing, were accused of fixing results. Federal prosecutors now say yes indeed, both were rigged by a As Russian mobster. The long arm of Russian organized crime reached across the globe this past February and into Salt Lake City with a pair of fixes for the Winter Olympics. U.S. Attorney James Comey says this man, alleged Russian mobster Alimzan Toktakunov, brokered a deal involving French and Russian judges voting for each other's skaters. He arranged a classic quid pro quo. We'll line up support. You'll line up support for the Russian pair. We'll line up support for the French pair, and everybody will go away with the gold, and perhaps there'll be a little gold for me, the Russian organized crime figure. The pair's ice skating was the story of the Salt Lake City Olympics. A Canadian couple skated flawlessly, yet lost the gold medal to a Russian pair who seemed to flub at least one landing. A French judge was later suspended and seemed to become the walking symbol of stained Olympic ideals. Some people have said, you are the Ben Laden of figure skating, and my God, how is it possible to say such, a, such an insult? It turns out now, according to prosecutors, that was only half the story. The ice dancing, which ended in gold for France, they say, was also fixed.